Great. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to give a minute or two to folks for folks to log on here, and then we'll get started with introductions and uh, our wonderful uh, session. Okay, just a quick note before I pass it over for the introductions. Um, <clears throat> we are going to uh, hold the questions until the end. If you have anything like really quick clarifying question, you can throw in the chat um, during, but uh, at the end, if you could please put your questions in the Q&A feature, it makes it easier for me, the moderator, to organize and uh, facilitate that discussion at the end. So if you could use that instead of the chat, uh, that's, that's more convenient and also, uh, please note in your question, if it's a student question, we want to prioritize student questions. So put a little asterisk or parentheses, student question or something like that, so that I know uh, to, to ask those questions first. Um, and yeah, I think, Lindsay, whenever you're ready, you can uh, go ahead and uh, take it away on our introduction. Sure. Well, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Rita, Rita, I, Rita Coley. Um, say it wrong, but she is uh, someone that I have known for absolutely a very long time. We went to um, junior and high school together, and uh, we, you know, kind of lost touch. And then I started seeing her name around. And she's just been doing really, really fascinating, important work um, since then. So I'm excited for her to come talk to you all. And um, I wanted to uh, give a little introduction, um, but I know that she will say more about her new book, uh, forthcoming book. She's an associate professor in uh, the Education Society and Culture Program at UC Riverside. Um, so one day, hopefully we can see her in person. Uh, it's not too far away. Um, she was formerly an Oakland Unified School District teacher. So um, she brings that to bear on her research and now is co-founder and co-director of the Institute for Teachers of Color committed to racial justice. Um, she serves as the co coordinator for UCR's teacher education programs, K-12 ethnic studies pathway. Um, so she has a, she's co-editor of a previous book, Confronting Racism in Teacher Education narratives from teacher ed educators, and her, uh, she's an author of her forthcoming book, Teachers of Color, Resisting Racism and Reclaiming Education um, by Harvard Education Press. She also has lots of awards. Um, she was the recipient of uh, UCR's Innovator for Social Change Award, uh, the um, uh, Scholar, Activist, and Community Advocacy Award from the Critical Educators for Social Justice Special Interest Group, AERA, Early Career Award, AERA Mid-Career Award um, for, uh, from the Division K, Teaching and Teacher Education of AERA just recently. Um, so many awards. Um, and uh, so we're really lucky to have her here with us today. Um, she'll tell you more about this forthcoming book. And, um, and this is something we're working hard on here at UCL, or UC I in our teacher education programs. Um, so we're really excited to um, hear what you've been working on and get some insights. And I'll turn it back over. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, I appreciate the warm introduction. It's so great to be in this work and community with you after so many years. Um, and uh, thank you for hosting me all here for this talk. Um, I'm joining as a guest on Tongva land, also known as Altadena, California. And it is such an honor to be here and share some of my work with you. Um, and while we're in different locations, I want us to take a moment to honor the lands that we currently occupy and to consider how we might stand in solidarity with First Nations and Indigenous people. 
So I just, I wanna start with the objectives of the talk, which are to examine racism as a barrier to diversity in the teaching force, um, as well as to unpack how those experiences are for teachers of color, the ways they resist racism, the way we imagine schools, and explore what teacher education, which as Lindsay mentioned, um, you all are grappling with, um, and schools can do to create environments welcoming and supportive of diverse teachers, for teachers of color specifically. And so before I get into all of that, I think it's important to operationalize the construct teachers of color because of its central focus to this talk. Um, I want to first acknowledge that there's no perfect label for a group of people. Labels for race, ethnicity, or other social groupings are socially constructed, they're politically influenced, and they change over time. And so while many of these categories were created as tools to oppress, racialized people have also reclaimed labels, privately embracing the community and collective agency built within these terms. So throughout this talk, when I speak of individual context, people and moments, I'll use specific racial identifiers such as Black, Indigenous, Asian American, Latinx. And when I'm speaking of racialized teachers in the aggregate, I'll use the term teachers of color with the recognition of its flaws and limitations in representing nuanced positionalities of diverse people. Um, but the educators in my research have used this construct, teachers of color, to foster solidarity as they do their work to resist and reclaim education. So I use it here also to honor and echo their words. So to begin, I think it's important for us to understand how our current teaching force has been shaped historically. And that starts with the purpose of schooling. And so the inception of schooling for racialized youth came from the desire to rid communities of color of their cultures, um, languages, and ways of being to so socialize them basically into English Protestant Eurocentric culture and to force them to adopt their place in the racial order. So when we look at these images in the in the slide of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania in the 1900s or the Kaolani Public School in Hawaii in 1907, you see this kind of um, socialization into nationalistic um, English Protestant dominant ways of thinking and being. And so even though there were these contexts that were subjugating to many communities, uh, teachers of color have always held an important place in trying to block the harm of schooling on their communities. So in government sponsored schools, for example, that were slated to Christianize and Americanize students, there were indigenous teachers who were seldom seen as capable by white staff and were often not trusted in their own communities because of their position in a white educational system. Yet these teachers resisted the strict and culturally violent policies and wove linguistic and cultural affirmation into the curriculum for their own young people. In Los Angeles County in the 1920s, um, when we saw English only mandates, the Mexican consul opened schools staffed with Mexican educators who explicitly taught Spanish language and Mexican history. Um, we saw this with Japanese Americans post internment um, creating educational spaces to reinstill their cultures and languages. And during segregation, there was also numerous accounts of African-American teachers who supported, cared for, and engaged the young of their community with high expectations. Yet, as we move along in time, with legislation for racial progress, we also saw consequences for communities of color that we don't always recognize, and that's shaped our educational system today. So um, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka 1954 is a prominent case that called for the legal integration um, or the desegregation of schools. And so many of us wouldn't be in the context we are today without this legislation. Yet, one of the things we don't talk about as much is that white families in this moment feared that their children would be educated by non-white teachers. And so one of the consequence was this pressure for African-American principals, teachers, counselors, coaches, band directors um, to, to leave the profession through, they were harassed, they were bullied, demoted, fired. And by 1964, at least 45% of black teachers had been fired or pushed out. And so I think that that context is really important for us to recognize that, that along with integration, we lost almost half of our black teaching force across the country. And so when we look at US public schools today, um, we have to understand that within that history and we're still have not yet made this progress. 
progress to create um, enough parity in the teaching force. So we're more than half of our teaching, our student population in US public schools are students of color. Uh, our teaching force remains almost 80% white. Um, and so we have to also really understand um, the struggles to change this, what, what it takes. And so I wanna also bring our attention to even more specifically to UC, um, University of California TEP enrollment. So this data is from 2018, 2019. And as an entire system in that year, we produced just 29 black teachers for the whole state and just six indigenous teachers for the whole state. And so I think this is really important for us to recognize around our responsibilities and our culpability in the continued maintenance of an un, un, a non-diverse teaching force. And so the things that kind of interest me around this are, why, why do these patterns continue to persist? And what is it like for black and indigenous and other teachers of color graduating into an overwhelmingly white profession with so few black indigenous and people of color peers? Um, and I myself am a scholar of critical race theory. Um, some of you might be familiar with critical race theory. It was in the news a lot in the fall with our former president. Um, there was a ban on critical race theory, so you might have heard more about it. Um, but I approach my analysis through that lens. So um, what it is, for those who are not familiar, CRT emerged in the late 1970s as a legal theory in response to the shortcomings of critical legal studies which critiqued the reproduction of power, but had a limited race analysis. And so critical race theory is used to name the mechanisms of systemic racism that undergird racial inequity. And one of the key concepts that was developed out of critical race theory by Derek Bell, who is one of the prominent scholars, is the notion of interest convergence. Derek Bell was a lawyer for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund who handled many school litigation cases in the 1960s, and he grew to believe in the permanence of racism in the United States. What he argued is that racial progress is only made when it converges with the material interests of whites and when it serves and does not disrupt the existing power structure. So when we look back to the example that I shared earlier of Brown versus Board of Education, Asian Americans, Mexican Americans, and African Americans had fought for years for access to better resources and conditions. But Bell argued that the success of that 1954 case was because it was converging with a negative global perception of the US as it related to race relations, right? So it wasn't for the good necessarily of these communities, even though they were fighting for it, but that there was this moment where there was a perception that the US needed to look better in its race relations. And so it gave in on this, on this case. And as we saw with my slide, my earlier slide, racial progress changed the structures in some ways, but racial harm and subjugation was maintained in other ways, like the teacher demographics and other things that we might know about, like tracking and rezoning to maintain segregation. Um, so shifting back to apply critical race theory to understand diversity in the teaching force, it's important to note that research has demonstrated that teachers of color play a strong role in student of color academic engagement and success. So teachers of color tend to have higher expectations of students of color. They tend to have more multicultural awareness and cultural responsiveness. They serve as cultural brokers between families and the school. Um, there's research that has shown that black students that have a black teacher tend to be disciplined less, I'm sorry. Um, they tend to be kicked out of the classroom less. They, um, there are increases in literacy. Black students who have a black teacher have higher reading levels. Um, so all of this has been demonstrated in the research and has been used as part of the rationale for the recruitment of teachers of color. And so while these contributions are important though, CRT scholars might argue in the highly racialized social structures of our country, that efforts for recruitment are not driven by interests in communities of color having self-determination over the education of their youth or students being exposed to diverse viewpoints and approaches, but really it's driven by the material benefits of schooling, such as attendance, achievement, things that tend to be tied to material gain, right? And so when we use a critical race theory lens to understand this, then we have to really start to understand what is motivating this, this 
recent and current push um, to diversify. And so while interest convergence has been used as a strategy for racial progress, such as in affirmative action in other cases, um, Bell and other CRT scholars have warned of the shortfalls of these kinds of deals. Because when we diversify with no real shifts to the structures of schools, teachers are being recruited into spaces that are still dominated by racialized policies and practices. And this kind of racial progress, just bringing teachers of color in without changing systems does not protect them from racial harm. And so we see the problems of using diversification as a remedy for racial inequity and injustice. Teachers of color who are being recruited move schools or leave the profession at a rate higher and faster than their white counterparts. And so what I'm here today to do is to unpack the complex experiences of teachers of color and to draw attention to the fact that, they, that school has been a cumulatively racializing place for them um, as they've experienced racism in their own K through 12 education and their teacher education and as practicing classroom teachers. And the research I'm going to present upon today picks up from the premise that teachers of color are being recruited into a predominantly white profession in a school system that is fraught with racism. So what I'm trying to explore are what impacts does that have on their well-being? Um, and also teachers of color, like communities of color, have always survived and resisted racism throughout time and schools are no different. So I want to understand what tools do teachers of color employ to survive, resist, and reimagine education for communities of color. So in our short time together, I will share five counter stories. Um, and the narratives I share are few because I want to show you the depth and nuance of their experiences, but they do represent patterns that have emerged across a plethora of hundreds of teachers um, in the data set across the country. Um, and counter stories, if you're unfamiliar, are also often rooted deeply in critical race theory as speaking back to dominant narratives by pointing out the institutional responsibility um, and centering marginality, Ooh, my slides are moving on their own, um, empowerment, resistance, and the dreams of communities of color. So I do wanna offer a trigger warning that some of the stories are hard to hear and they explore loss and grief, but the teachers were clear that they wanted their stories heard. Okay, so, the first question that I posed was about the impacts of racism. If you talk to most teachers in the US, you learn that stress is a typical part of the profession. Schools are under-resourced, they're overcrowded, the workload is high, teachers are underpaid. A national poll on occupational stress found that almost half of teachers surveyed reported high daily stress, tying them with nurses for the most stressful occupation. Um, and I'm not sure how that's changed during COVID. I'm sure we're seeing nurses' stress is probably pretty high. And I think now with schools transitioning back, teachers might also be experiencing a lot of stress as well. Um, yet within the taxing conditions of the teaching profession, teachers of color are experiencing an additional layer of stress, which we call racial stress, um, the stress associated with racism. And it has been documented that repeated exposure to racism and racial stress can compromise one's psychological and physiological well being, as well as hinder one's ability to cope with stress. And so, Professor William Smith from the University of Utah coined the term um, racial battle fatigue as the psychological, physiological, emotional, and behavioral toll of racism on people of color. Um, Smith and his colleagues, Terry Yoso and Daniel Solorsono, explain the stress of unavoidable frontline racial battles in historically white spaces leads to people of color feeling mentally, emotionally, and physically drained. The stress from racial microaggressions and macroaggressions can become lethal when, when the accumulation of physiological symptoms of racial battle fatigue are untreated, undiagnosed, I mean, unnoticed, misdiagnosed, or personally dismissed. And so in, in and beyond, in it, and in addition to schools or our professional spheres, um, these are the impacts of racial battle fatigue. So an exorbitant investment of time and energy into thinking about and dealing with racism, hypervigilance, that superhero syndrome where you feel like you have to kind of hold it all, do it all, lowered aspirations, self-censorship, isolation, social withdrawal, 
exhaustion, anxiety, frustration, anger, suppressing anger, helplessness, hopelessness, and depression. Um, so, you know, with our current context and everything going on, many of you may also be feeling these symptoms, watching the layers of racial violence that we have witnessed this past year. So to share a counter story that exemplifies the racial stress and battle fatigue that teachers of color endure, I'm going to tell you the story of Carla. Carla was born in Mexico, but resettled with her family in a small rural town in California when she was four years old. Throughout her education, she went to school with a significant population of Latinx students, but she never had a Latinx teacher and the predominantly white teachers she did have viewed her family and community through a deficit lens and even ridiculed her parents. In college, she took few, a few education classes that helped her problematize her educational journey and she decided to become an elementary teacher. She said, I wanted to be the teacher who would understand my students and the inequities going on in the school. I wanted to be that teacher I never had. Once in the credentialing program, Carla quickly realized that it wasn't providing the tools she needed to be the teacher she envisioned. The theoretical frames that drove her to the classroom were absent. She watched as white students would receive praise for surface level attempts to discuss equity. And when she tried to assert her critical understanding, she felt silenced. In her student teaching placement, Carla shared how she had to sit through lectures that neglected students' realities and identities. But her guiding teacher was upset that Carla was not following her modeling in the classroom. The teacher eventually said to her, if the principal asks if I should give you a job, I'll say no. I think you should reconsider teaching. I don't think this is the job for you. While this was happening, Carla started experiencing continuous chest pains. One day she was driving from student teaching to class and her left side went numb. Mind you, she's in her early twenties. Um, she thought she was having a heart attack. Scared, she checked herself into the hospital. And after some tests, the doctors determined that the root was extreme stress. While we know that teaching and teacher education programs can be stressful for all teacher candidates, this was compounded for Carla with racial stress, the physical consequences on her well being from experiencing all of the racism she was enduring. So she took a leave and she did not apply for teaching jobs. Um, so as we can see in that story, as a result of, or in addition to racial stress, we also see the racialized push out of teachers of color. And so Eve Tuck has defined this in terms of student push out um, instead of dropout. You know, there's been a push uh, with Michelle Fine in the 90s to reframe student dropout as student push out. Um, this idea of being systematically forced out due to the lack of support, encouragement, or an inclusive environment. And, I, and in my work, I, I conceptualizing the same for teachers of color. Um, so what we often refer to as teacher burnout, oh, teachers leave because they're burnout, they can't handle it, it's too stressful, it takes a toll. But for many justice oriented teachers of color, it's actually a systematic push out. And to show how this works um, further, I'm gonna share the story of Amiko, a Japanese American elementary educator from the San Francisco Bay Area who attended a boutique teacher education program that unlike Carlos program was focused on social justice. Amiko shared, on the last Saturday of every month, we would advertise and lots of families in the neighborhood would come and we would do these liter literacy workshops and then have a big potluck and some singing or a puppet show. Just something we would perform for the families in the mission. We would cook the food and serve it and it just felt like it was a beautiful community connection. It taught me the value of building those relationships with the people in your community. And so um, unlike Carla, Amiko was exposed to a very community oriented um, teacher education program that really aligned with her vision for what she wanted to do in the schools. She did continue to say the program drew a fair amount of like-minded individuals, but it was still a pretty white cohort overall. There was space to talk about the needs of kids of color and to make sure that was something that everyone in the room was thinking about, putting energy into and prioritizing. There wasn't much dialogue about what it was to be an educator of color. When I got into the workforce as the teacher of color, it was a real shock to my system. So after graduating, um, Miko secured a job across the Bay at an elementary school named after a black activist that she admired. Serving a diverse student body, she learned that the students had been exposed to very little about the namesake of the school or about their own history. 
So with several like-minded teachers at the school, she planned different events that centered black and other people of color histories, cultures, and activism. And although the community was excited and engaged, the predominantly white teacher staff resisted and even undermined these efforts, expressing shame and embarrassment in celebrating such, as they said, radical history. She shared. I also initiated an Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month celebration. Lots of pushback on that. Um, so every time I was trying to bring something to the community, um, the families were for it, the kids loved it, gobbled it up, was feeding their souls. And, you know, there was just the, the institution and the teachers who represent the institution and the dominant narrative, the oppressive narrative that kept trying to squash these sorts of community-centered, um, POC-centered kinds of events and celebrations. So they began to personally target her, making it challenging for her to get things done at work. So she went to her principal and asked him for support. And Amiko describes their conversation. This is my school. I love this school. I love the Malcolm X community. I love Malcolm X, the man and his legacy. I want to stay here, but I can't stay here under these conditions. What are you going to do about it? He did nothing. All he said was, it would be a shame if you left, but I understand if you leave. And making the decision to go was the hardest decision of my life. I firmly believe that I was gonna stay at Malcolm for the duration of my teaching career. And imagine being at another school. But I also could not live year after year in progressively damaging and oppressive conditions. That was crushing my soul and crushing my spirit. And so she left. So these two teachers were pushed out of the school um, or the profession, but thankfully both persisted and are now currently still teaching. Um, out of the narratives I analyzed, three key tools emerged that supported the retention and resistance of teachers of color, who many of which had felt that kind of racialized push out. And the first tool is racial literacy. So much like any kind of li literacy, reading, math, um, understanding how racism operates in our world is a literacy and it takes practice to develop and sharpen it. Um, Lonnie Gounier, who's a critical race scholar from Harvard um, in 2004, defined this as the capacity to decipher the durable racial grammar that structures racialized hierarchies and frames the narrative of our republic. And so in much of the literature, racial literacy, when it's been applied to education, is discussed as something that teachers need to have to be culturally responsive and sustaining to students of color and the racism that students are navigating. But I found that it is a key tool in the survival of teachers of color as they navigate racially hostile spaces. So Liza is a queer Latina teacher who worked in a school that transitioned students out of juvenile hall. She was the only Latina and only native Spanish speaker on staff. She took a relational approach to teaching and had a strong um, connections with students. She was invited to family baptisms, quinceañeras, she was often asked by her peers to translate with families, but her administrators and other teachers always questioned her relationships with the students, asking her, was she related to them? One teacher even asked if she was so effective with her students because um, was she in a gang herself? They couldn't wrap their head around her deep connectivity with her students. And so she shares a heartbreaking story of navigating the profession of teaching while processing her own loss and pain. Uh, I had lost my 27th student to gang violence and I broke down. And when I went to speak to the administrators about needing time to get away and to grieve the student, they were very um, unapologetically callous. It was very matter of fact, you know, um, what do you think the work is? 
you know that the students that you work with and that's just what they do to each other. Um, it was okay to them. And I was taking it too personal. And so again, I was questioned about whether or not I had an outside relationship with the students. Like, are you related to them? Um, we can't give you bereavement time. You can't just take time off because you're not related to them or there was no appreciation for the human life that our students were. Me having to take literally time off of work because my employers just were not taking my stresses seriously. When I was saying that I needed time, I would get a guilt trip or I would get a dismissal of like, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, like all of us here, are working with the same kids, you're just taking it too personal, you need to distance yourself, um, you need to find a, a balance, or if you can't handle this, and you know, this is the job, maybe you should find another job. Um, and I had to literally have a mental breakdown, emotional breakdown, where I could not even get out of bed. And I went into triage and crisis at Kaiser um, for mental health completely falling apart um, and had to get medical notes for them to take me seriously that I could not continue this work without support or resources or feeling that my words were important or that my experiences were important. So as we see in Liza's heartbreaking story, um, she's a relational educator. Her experiences of pain from losing her students is natural. However, she works in an institution that doesn't value the life of young people or her love, connection, and accountability to them. The message she received is, we like that you speak Spanish, that you connect to your students, but you shouldn't care about them. It shouldn't impact you because it doesn't impact us. Being a teacher is like being like us, deficit-minded and emotionally detached. And if you can't handle it, this job isn't for you, right? And we heard that similar narrative with Carla as well, that this job is not for you. Um, so as with Liza, related to the analysis of interest convergence, the labor of teachers of color is often understood only in terms of its material value to schools. So the ability to raise student of color test scores, communicate with families, rather than its humanistic value, their relationality, their pedagogy, their advocacy. And so building from Marx's definition of commodification, their labor production is separated from their humanity. And so we're talking about, in a sense, a commodification of teachers of color. When we diversify schools without changing the paradigm, without creating humanizing spaces for students, young people, for them, we are, in a sense, commodifying them. And so trying to make sense of her experiences, Liza attended a professional development conference for educators focused on racism and racial justice in schools. There she attended a talk on racial battle fatigue, the concept I explained earlier, and a concept she had not previously known. And she felt they were describing her. When the talk ended, she quietly raised her hand and stood up in front of a room of 50 strangers and shared the extremely personal story we just heard. And she told the participants that she was thinking of walking away from teaching, but hearing the research on racial battle fatigue put words to her experiences and helped her realize that it's the system that caused her to break down, not her own weakness. And that experience was a turning point for Liza. She began to read more critical theory and research. She built relationships with other like-minded teachers to discuss her ideas. And she explained reading about it, whether it's essays, books, or even blogs, Talking about my experiences and actually having the tools and words that I did not have before has been very healing and cathartic in terms of knowing that I'm not paranoid and that I'm not crazy. The strengthening of her racial literacy, um, the reframing of her experiences through racial theory was a powerful force that helped Liza resist the narrative that she does not belong in the profession and grow even more strongly into the transformative activist educator she had dreamed of being. And so Liza left her school, but she's still in teaching. She's in a new school and she has now secured a large grant to build wraparound services for students who are transitioning back from juvenile hall. The next tool of survival and resistance that I wanna share is um, communities of resistance. And so 
building from bell hooks notion that for for one of the most vital ways we sustain ourselves is by building communities of resistance, places where we know we are not alone. And so here I share the story of Lamar, a black male elementary educator in Virginia. Working at a school serving primarily black students, he repeatedly brought up to the staff an urgency to shift their pedagogy towards the needs of struggling students. But his predominantly white peers went from ignoring him to resenting his voice. An instructional coach interpreted Lamar's comments as defiant and reported him to the principal for not following the curriculum that had been decided upon. Teachers started spreading rumors about his competence, his education, years of experience and classroom success disregarded. Lamar felt isolated and started experiencing great stress and anxiety coming to work. Seeking support, he came, out upon, came upon and applied to the Institute for Teachers of Color Committed to Racial Justice, which I know Lindsay at the beginning mentioned that I am the co-founder director of, um, which is an organization dedicated to the racial literacy and racial justice leadership development of teachers of color. And the next summer he flew to California and as he walked into the room of 150 teachers of color from across the country, he described that he immediately felt at home. He shared the last couple of years, I had doubts about staying in the profession, but with the tools, connections and resources, something about the experience pushed me to know more and think more critically about our education system and not just my personal experiences. And now I understand more where the things that I experienced came from what they're rooted in. And I don't think that it's me, which is a theme we saw before. Um, so being part of the community of resistance helped Lamar to see that the struggle of education existed beyond his context. And like Liza, realized it's not just me. Um, and when we returned to school that fall, things shifted, he said. For so long, I was afraid to speak up about these issues. I felt like I had to teach correct history in secret. I felt like I had a special eye for me um, on me from white leaders. Now my hope ultimately is to have a bigger impact. I don't want to back down. I started talking for the first time at faculty meetings about racism in our schools, about injustice in our schools, and about the way that we do things. That led to a number of conversations with my principal, and I have built some relationships with other teachers in my building because of that. I now say what needs to be said, and I never did that before, and I'm not holding anything in, so I don't feel stressed at work anymore. So meeting other teachers of color who are actively working to disrupt injustice in schools aided in his retention, relieved his stress and supported his capacity to resist racism in his school context and beyond. He started being more direct and open and having conversations about racism with his peers and his principal. Lamar ultimately stood in front of the Board of Education and District Superintendent and called for a reevaluation of racial bias in the curriculum. And the last tool of survival um, and resistance I want to share is organizing for change. And so Robin D.G. Kelly in his book on the Black Radical Imagination reminds us that staying in a state of opposition can be debilitating. That as we see being only in the fight takes its toll. He shared that our true, lib true liberation is in dreaming. And so it's important to move past what we're fighting against to start to really think about what are we fighting for. And so what does a classroom look like that is humanizing and racially just? What is a pedagogy where students of color feel seen, nurtured in relationship and whole? And what does learning look like when it's meaningful and connected to students' lives? And that brings me to my last story. Julian is a high school English teacher in the Coachella Valley of Southern California that was born from a lineage of Chicanx activists. His grandfather was part of the Zoot Suit riots in the 40s, and many of his tias and theos were involved in the United Farm Workers Movement, Chicano Power Movement of the 60s and 70s. So as Julian recalls, conversations around the dinner table were all often about critical consciousness, social awareness, and self-determination in the face of a racist system. He says, inside my house, it was a lot of love, a lot of care, a lot of support, a lot of history, a lot of centering who I am. But when he would walk out the door of his home, the narrative about him, his community the, and the world was completely different. In seventh grade, Julian was enrolled in a drafting class where they drew two, three and four dimensional figures. And he was really enjoying the curriculum. One of the assignments was to build a plane. They had to draft it with real measurements and they were to create an actual model of the plane out of cardboard. On the day the class was transitioning from drawing to building, Julian came to school with excitement but his teacher blocked him at the door. He shared their dialogue. Julian, you can't enter the classroom. What do you mean I can't enter the class? Why? 
you can't enter the classroom because we're using exacto knives and I don't know if you're gonna stab somebody and I don't want anybody killed on my watch. Julian was surprised and frustrated and he says, well then can you just give me my drawing so I can build it at home? No, you can't build it at home because I won't know if you did it or not and I won't be able to give you credit. For the next two weeks while Julian's peers were cutting and building their models, he wasn't allowed to attend class. At the end of the term, the teacher gave him an F for his grade. And he, Julian shared that this was a memorable example of his racialization, but not an isolated one. He felt these tensions in all of his classes, whether it was English, math, or history. Fueled by the critical lens he was learning at home, he would challenge his teacher's Eurocentric and deficit narratives, and they would tell him he was wrong, claim he didn't know what he was saying, and kick him out of class. He expressed, I was in the process where you just can't succeed. So that conditioned me to believe I wasn't intelligent, that I didn't belong in school, and that maybe the narratives told, being told to me by educators were true. Julian barely graduated, but with the support of his mom, who woke him up, drove him to the SAT, held him accountable to applying for colleges, he made it to college and became an ethnic studies major. And with the racial literacy garnered through that program, he began to reflect on his community and purpose. He said, I know we lost a lot of good people because they were kicked out of schools. I know that a lot of lives would have been different if we would have had the opportunity to learn. I wanna be a teacher. I wanna go back and I'm gonna change everything. I wanna I want to change it all. We don't have to buy into that old traditional way of teaching. It doesn't have to be the way that it is. What if we don't have English classes and we just have Chicano literature classes? What if we don't have history classes and we have ethnic studies classes? What if we don't have math and we have this other type of math? What if we bring in programs? What if we hire new people? We make them go through this training. And that is just what he did. He went back and he organized with community members and other teachers. It wasn't easy, it was an uphill battle, but now they have 18 unique courses and over 60 sections across the district that are taught through an ethnic studies lens. Um, they have a budget from the district for professional development for, to support current teachers developing their skills. And they've added the knowledge of ethnic studies as a preferred qualification for all future hires in all disciplines. And so Julian shared that he now has two sons in high school and he was talking to one of them. And this is what he said. You know, when I was growing up, I said, look, I went through 12 years, 13 years of education, right? Traveling kindergarten. One or two teachers I can really pinpoint yeah. that help me. And the experience now in high school through our programming, I told them you might have the opposite. You might have one or two teachers that are trying to hold you down, but you're gonna have you're gonna be insulated, and your experience is gonna be so concentrated with these folks that you're gonna be able to find how great you truly are. And so this teacher who in his own education um, carried the dreams of his ancestors and his family um, for a, a activist transformed education, but was really um, marginalized in his own education, but now has worked to transform and reimagine schools so that his own sons can find out how great they truly are. And isn't that what we want? for all kids to be able to find out how great they truly are. And so going back to the research questions, when we recruit teachers into spaces that are historically and currently predominantly white and racially hostile, we're exposing them to racial harm. But let, much like our history tells us, communities of color are strong and resilient and have resistant capital that helps them survive and push towards change. And we need teachers of color in the schools they possess incredible power to challenge and reimagine classrooms, schools, and districts. In a sense, they are the radical imagination, shifting the epistemologies of schools. And it may be tempting to rely on their strengths to remedy what is wrong with the education system, but teachers of color did not create the inequities that exist. Um, while their survival and love for their community is intertwined in the racial justice work of teachers of color, with such a tax to their well being in this work, they shouldn't be responsible for shouldering this burden. Leaders and practitioners of teacher education, schools and districts must also be accountable to challenge racism in multifaceted ways and create spaces that feel welcoming, safe and responsive to marginalized people. That institutional accountability 
also that to challenge racism and strive for racial justice, it also cannot be fleeting, abstract or surface level. Um, a response to social pressure, a social moment, which I think we saw a lot of last summer, um, these kinds of more surface level strives. I think I got a racial justice commitment email from Big Lots or <laughs> Petco and other things. Uh, but we need to approach this work in substantive, concrete and sustained ways. And so Rather than relying on teachers of color to carry race work in schools, administrators must begin to recognize racial literacy as a core competency for all staff. Um, adding, you can add, as we saw with Julian's case, adding asset framing of communities of color to hiring rubrics, providing racial literacy development for existing staff, forming compensated committees for racial justice work, dedicating time within staff meetings to reflect upon patterns of racial inequities in policies and practices. And for teachers of color to not be racially isolated, this should also include strategic efforts to recruit for diversity in the teaching staff through university partnerships, as well as community-based pipeline programs, such as Grow Your Own Models. But because solving racism is not a simple one-size-fits-all and requires strategic and sustained response, I wanna leave you with some questions. Um, so for teacher education programs, what policies and practices serve as barriers to the presence and well-being of teacher candidates of color? How are staff and mentor teachers both equipped and developed to serve teacher candidates of color? In what ways does the program establish and monitor learning environments that address racism and reflect the histories, cultures, and value systems of teacher candidates of color? And for schools and districts, what kinds of contributions are you expecting from your teachers of color and how does that differ from your expectations of white teachers? How do you communicate your trust and value of teachers of color? Do you listen to their insights and understandings? How do you invest in the growth, leadership, and visions of teachers of color? Do you materially recognize their unique assets and strengths through compensation, informal evaluations, and leadership opportunities? And standing on the shoulders of their ancestors, teachers of color have endured great harm as they resist racial injustice in schools. Yet they are powerful actors in the process of reclaiming education from legacies of white supremacy and they must be supported, appreciated, and honored as they strive to create humanizing, holistic places of learning and joy for students of color. So I will end there. And I just wanna say that um, my, this talk today is built on data from my book. Um, and so I wanted to just offer that if you go to the publisher, it's also available on Bookshop and Amazon, but if you go to the publisher, you can get a 20% discount code. Thank you so much, Rita. That was a beautiful, uh, beautiful talk. And thank you for sharing those incredibly powerful stories. Um, uh, we'll give the audience a minute or two to kind of collect, collect their thoughts. And please post any questions you have in the Q&A feature. And then I will uh, read them out. And again, if you're a student, please uh, indicate that you're, it's a student question. can stop sharing too. Should I stop sharing the screen? Um, sure, yeah. We have a hand, well, we've had a hand for a while too. Uh, let's see who the hand is. Carol Normandine, did you have a question? Uh, or was that a, oh, here's a chat. Oh, we have a thank you in the chat. Uh, Carol, if you have a question, I don't know if we can unmute people. Oh, I could. Yeah, I could allow someone to talk. Carol, uh, can you indicate in the chat whether this is an intentional hand that's up? I know it's been up for a little bit since the, during the talk. I guess uh, while we wait for people to formulate thoughts, um, I have a question like uh, you said you did lots and lots of interviews. Like what, uh, did you get a sense of what percentage of, of, the, of the people that you interviewed had these kind of like triumphant 
uh, like the people, the examples you used were incredible and people who are like doing like world changing stuff. Like what is, how common was that? Like, is that, uh, I don't know. It was very inspiring, but I want to know like, is, does this happen all the time? Or is like, are these like really special cases? That's a really great question. Um, thank you for that. I, so I interviewed a range of people from pre-service to veteran educators and they were all justice oriented educators. Um, they have they self-identify as having these commitments to asset framing having these commitments to activism in their schools and so i think these are these are going to be a subset of teachers that are interested in transforming schools so you're going to see that more often but i think this really um transformative reimagination that we're seeing was happening more for the the veteran educators who've been there. And I think some of them have become part of teacher activist groups where they've been in community with each other and have been supporting each other. So you're seeing a bit more of that. Um, but for some of the, the pre-service folks that I interviewed, um, you know, they're just getting started and they're feeling really overwhelmed just navigating. So, um, but I have a whole chapter <laughs> dedicated to stories like that. Um, and I think in different ways, you know, we have, we see people who are pushing for that transformation in their own classrooms and they're doing really creative, amazing, innovative things in their own classrooms. And then there are others who are thinking more systemically and have the capacity now because they've been in the classroom mastering that for years that they can now start to think about like, how do I change this across my school? How do I change this across the district? How do I start to organize with other, other educators and really um, push for something different. And, and the ones who were really successful at it, I will say the majority of them were not doing this alone. They were doing this in community with other teachers or with parents, family, you know, community members, other folks like that. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for sharing these um, examples. They're really empowering. And I think um, I'm so glad that you wrote a wonderful book about it and that people can see those examples and be inspired by them. I think that's, um, that's great. Okay, we have a couple questions now. Um, uh, the first one is from Allison, one of our PhD students. And it says, thank you for this talk. I know you talked about how structures should be responsive to community needs, but I'm wondering what institutional structures broadly in teacher education you see as promising paths forward. Um, thanks, Allison. That's a really tough complicated question uh, teacher ed is a is a very entrenched um institution that for generations and generations has been reproducing many of the same patterns of educators i mean i think when we look at the demographics on the teaching force that hasn't really shifted all that dramatically um i recently saw a report from aacte which is the association of um, American Association of Teacher Educators, Colleges of Teacher, uh, something like that. <laughs> and they had, uh, the stats were, sh were astounding. 87% of um, deans and associate deans are white. Um, the instructors, I think it was tenure track instructors was 90% white. Um, Non-tenure track instructors was in the mid to high 80s also. Um, so we're seeing this on all layers. The, the percentage of students enrolled in the programs is 70% um, and upwards. And so we're just seeing this is very static, right? We wonder why this is not changing in schools and districts. And then as folks who work in teacher ed, I mean, I think what are we doing in these leverage points to really change admissions processes? Um, what are we doing to, to start to see racial literacy as a core competency in who we let into our programs, the way that we see their disciplinary um, kind of connections? I think UCLA has done some tremendous work. I think they, they will say they have a lot of work to do, but I think that's a program that I feel is um, leaps and bounds ahead. I mean, I think years ago they got rid of the GRE as one of the, the factors. Um, they have more of a holistic admissions process and they start to really prioritize students' ability to talk and think about structures of oppression as part of the criterion to get into a program. And so then that changes how who's there and then the curriculum 
and content and where teachers are placed has to match that too. So there are models, um, but I think overwhelmingly, even with things like Grow Your Own programs, we're seeing students um, who are being recruited from communities and cohorts still being integrated into these programs that are not speaking to their needs. So there's a lot of, a lot of work to do. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, we have another student question from Michelle, another one of our PhD students. Uh, she says, thinking about how we can make structural changes to disrupt this commodification of teachers that happens um, using um, Bell's lens of interest convergence, what role does test scores play in reproducing the commodification of teachers of color? And uh, she also wonders if you thought specifically about the role of increasing emphasis on test scores in the Bush era in the commodification of teaching? Yeah, that's a, that's a really important question. I mean, I think the accountability um, testing increased with Bush. I think it was further solidified under Obama's race to the top. Um, and so we see more testing of kids than we've seen in a long, 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 long time that's still um, highly in place. And I think part of what is intertwined with this interest convergence is that it's been shown that student, students of color achievement is tied to having teachers that reflect them, this like ethnic matching work um, of Easton Brooks, um, Donald Easton Brooks, who's the Dean at University of Nevada, Reno has really pioneered a lot of that work um, several decades ago and continued on and showing that students tend to do well and better in their academic achievement when they're with, um, you know, more diverse teaching group. There was a um, some research in 2016 that showed also that students of all races preferred having teachers of color because they felt like their classrooms were or having a diverse teaching force allowed them to have more engaged pedagogy. And so then those things like the, what you see with the research on ethnic studies is tied to increased attendance, increased increased engagement, and so that's often seen as tied to also increases in test scores. And so I think that's where that interest convergence comes in that it's not necessarily just their bodies <laughs> that's making them do better with kids. And so if we're not really allowing teachers of color to be holistically who they are in those spaces, if we're just using them as a vehicle for achievement, that that doesn't necessarily have the same impact um, and should not be the only rationale for why we would have a diverse teaching force. I don't know if either of you have thoughts on this. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure. Are we, do we have any more student questions on this? Uh, not for the moment, but folks still have chance to put in anything, any other questions that they have. And Lindsay and Andres, if you have thoughts on these issues too, I'd love to hear, you know, I think it'd be great to hear from, from you as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you know, I, we've had a lot of conversations in our um, teacher education steering program, and we have um, sort of you know, two different strands in our program. Um, well, we have a couple strands, but we have a, a program that builds from our undergraduate students. And then we have um, a teacher education program that, you know, recruits at the MAT level, um, stu recruits students. And we've, you know, uh, just, we, we have a, a inc we're increasing the diversity of our applicants, but really, you know, we have a lot to, of work to do in the program. Um, in the programs as well. I'm sure, you know, um, we're continuing to do that work, but we're also really trying to make connections to um, increase our, our applications as well. Um, and because it sort of feel, you know, we kind of want to work with uh, students we have and then, you know, but also of course, make sure that the environment is right for them. So I wondered if you had any, had any particular uh, recommendations or thoughts for um, kind of, you know, reaching uh, communities of color as well um, in the recruitment stage um, and sort of building these connections in these communities. We have, we've, we've, we're trying different things, but would love to have your thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I remember visiting with you all and hearing about your future teachers of color group, which I believe is, is that for undergrad or is that a grad group? 
Yeah, we have, so with our undergrads um, that comes, we have the program that comes directly. Um, yeah, we recruit at the undergraduate level and then, but yeah, we're also bringing in uh, the students. I mean, also our MIT students. Yeah, so I think that that matters a lot. I mean, if, what we learned from the Grow Your Own programs and models is that if we're starting from recruitment from high school age, even if there's partnerships we can make with schools, I've seen um, pathways to teaching in, in Colorado that um, Margarita Bianco runs that has a program where they partner with a high school teacher and they get AP credit for, or college credit for taking a class on what does it mean to to be a teacher and what does it mean to be in education and um, to teach towards uh, remedying inequities. And, and so then the students who take that then are on this pathway to kind of entering as education majors as we grow our education majors across the UC. I mean, I think this is a really powerful moment to, to understand who, who enters our program. I mean, I think we have a lot of um, uh, let Latinx students in our program and we're a majority student of color program, but we still, as you saw in that chart, we had in 2018, we had two black teachers at UCR. So um, we have a lot of work to do around kind of notions of anti-blackness that are, are taking black students away from, they're not directing them towards our programs. And so I think there's just a lot, a lot, a lot of different pressure points that we have to consider when we're doing this work. But I think that that pipeline work is really important and um, having really great folks teaching those classes that are exposing them to issues that reflect their own educational experiences in their communities. I know you have um, a true gem, Diane Navarez is, uh, is, teaches in your undergrad program. And I know that she does a lot of that work um, in her in her courses as well. And so I think having more instructors like that um, is another way. Awesome, okay. Well, just looking at the time, I think um, we've reached the hour. Um, so I just wanna say on behalf of our whole school community, uh, thank you so much, Rita, for sharing uh, your wonderful work with us. And yeah, we hope, like Lindsay said earlier, that we can um, meet you in person one day, not too far in the future. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to hear my work. Awesome, okay. See you everybody and thanks for coming. Thanks.